the Islanders. Winters, when we set our traps offshore, we saw an island further out than ours, miraged in midday haze, but lifting clear at dawn or late flat light in cliffs that might have been sheer ice. It seemed then so near that each man turning home with his slim catch made promises beyond the limits of his gear and boat. But mornings we cast off to watch the memory blur as we attempted it and set and hauled on ledges we could fetch and still come home. Summers, when we washed in shore again, not one of us would say the island's name. Though none at anchor sloshed the gurry from his deck without one eye on that magnetic course the ospreys fished. Winters, then, we knew which way to steer beyond marked charts and saw the island as first islanders first saw it, who watched it blur at noon, yet harbored knowing it was real and fished like us offshore as if it were. The Ship Watches north of the tropics, still dwarfed by the ocean that pocked her iron plates, she's anchored herself off Searsport and swung on her hook for a week's end, a salt mile offshore. Searsport's no liberty port, it's barely a harbor, a wharf, a tidal point of white houses, thick with their cargo of snow. Nobody local knows why she's here, her fires apparently banked, with only the rusted top of her smokestack smudging the frozen air. Talk says that her crew's all sick, but men on a catwalk bend to chip paint. Others stand watch on the wings of her bridge in what through binoculars looks like health. She's flown no quarantine flag, no boats put ashore for a doctor, water, or food. Nobody's even landed, in fact, to pay some small respect to the harbor master. Because of the rumor of plague, he's ordered the fish boats to stay in port. The windows of every drowned grandfather's house are busy with rumors, widows. Not so much watching the ship herself as watching their husbands congress the wharf. They all agree by her plimsoll marks that she's slightly down by the bow perhaps because of the crates on her foredeck. Still, she's shown no sign of distress. Although her shear is foreign, her lights conform to international rules. The consensus is that she isn't Russian. But no man wakes in Searsport who doesn't get up to look for her flag. The women, had they a right word, would pray some name on her transom. If only she'd signal her business, call Mayday, or put in for help, Searsport might ease its distress. Searsport sent more captains to sea than any main port in history. Its children, even, are baptized by disaster. Yet even the town's most famous son, a mutineer hung in the cross trees, could never imagine an old tramp tired of passage, who simply put in, in need of reflection at anchor. Whatever port Searsport once was, she found it no harbor of refuge. 
after she'd lain here only three days and kept her own silence from Friday through Sunday, every white house and upright church, self-exiled by anger, prided itself with outrage. Whatever her registry, tonnage, or name, whatever it was she came for, Searsport delivered no goods to her hold and recovered no profit from what she might light. She stoked up her fires early this morning and weighed her great hook before breakfast. Watching her hull and then her thin plume of smoke sink over the known horizon, the town stood as close to attention as Maine is ever with strangers likely to get. As long as men fish who wakes bound to royal the turn tide and churn the fogged bell the fish boats bear on, sounding their own thin horns to locate each other, until Searsport melts or the bay freezes over, the natives are liable to never recover. Denying this coast as if it didn't exist, the ship made raw her departure around the three-mile black buoy. It's always been out there, seaward of every quilt belt and the town's five steeples, a secular bell for the exiled ear to home on, tended by gulls in its floating cage, tolling both warning and sea room. Nobody paid it much mind until this morning. The ship, edging out, gave it nine great blasts on her horn, as if in familiar salute. Chart 1203, Penobscot Bay and Approaches. Whoever works a storm to windward, sails in rain or navigates in island fog, must reckon from the slow swung lead, from squalls on cheek, must bear by compass, chart and log. Parallels are ruled from compass rows to known red none, but still the landfall leg risks set of tide, lost buoys, and breakers noise on shore where no shore was. Whoever plots his homing on these eastward islands knows how sou'west smoke obscures the sunny charts, how gulls cry on a numberless black spar. Where north is west of north, not true, he pilots best who feels the coast for standpipe, spire, tower, or stack, who owns local knowledge of shoal or ledge, whose salt nose smells the spruce shore. Where echoes drift, where the blind groundswell clangs an iron bell, his fishhook hand keeps steady on the helm. He weathers rain squall, line storm, fear, who bears away from the sound of sirens, wooing him to the capes, safe lee. He knows the ghost ship bow, the sudden headland imminent in fog. But where rocks wander, he steers down the channel that his courage dredges. He knows the chart is not the sea. Sable Island, 60 degrees west, 43 degrees and 56 minutes north. You wouldn't want to go there. Sand is all there is, a graveyard strip of ship's bones in the North Atlantic, backbones, dead eyes, ribs, 
cast up like the dune itself by an antic surf. Cabot chose not to land. A Portuguese pilot first named it Santa Cruz, drifting for fish on the king's orders. It was longer then before the unchristly wash of wind broke up the bar in stranger shapes than the cross, which never formed it. All known charts by 1546 marked its luck as sable, prized as bad luck for the centuries of full-sail trade which civilized that beach with skeletons and cross trees. 250 known wrecks ghost it now, Gloucestermen, British men-of-war and Greeks, Nova Scotiamen and Vikings. Henry stranded his Bastille convicts there with pardons. A woman with rings on her fingers lost there when the ship Amelia sank with all hands had an emerald hacked off her corpse by professional wreckers. People have tried to live there all right, lighted hopes, seed, cattle, most of which died. Ganged horses still churn those sands, wild as the madmen shipped to asylum and burial there. A Boston parson petitioned to own it once, but granted his gift could find no sane person to harvest the crop he claimed his stunted bushes grew in that private Elysium. There was a harbor there years ago, but where only God knows, now that the tides have sanded it, smooth as an eel. Save for the cumulus hung in mounted thermals over those flat dunes, still as fast ice, you wouldn't know a landfall was in the offing, not even close in if you drifted forty hours in a lifeboat and woke with the sea making up and the first fog lifted. No upraised oars will get you help there, half swamped by the chop, and not so much bound to any haven ahead as running hull down in the heavy troughs from any last watch kept aloft and all false havens astern. Only the loud surf sounds this shore, patrolled by a raft of gulls and buoyed by the anvil cloud. Half-drowned fishermen home from Davy Jones' fleet tell how the first boy born to castaways here will be island king. But no one yet has survived this beachhead by divine right or weathered the breaking tons of sea to couple his hope with dead myths. The cloud itself might warn you away, yet sighting it first from an open boat, like many who risk the sea, you have no choice of refuge left. You might even, tugged in under the lee of this island, think yourself safe and forget its history or how you happen to be here. Seen from a mast step broken by gales, it looks huge, as it is. No matter what new disasters to come, you must shape your course into the breakers as though it were the whole world, not just a strip of blown sand you happen to be cast up on. Bolt.
It shot all right, this bolt about as long as a small boy's forearm, thick as a man's first finger, except for its square iron head and square nut. The female threads frozen by rust to the bolt itself, gorged and ridged like a mined-out range of hills, maybe on some peninsula far to the north. A cold salt fog has finally settled its dust, its pits are dark as marrow, the oxidized ridges lifted gold, like ferrous tailings the sun only recently left. God only knows what it once held together, what weathered away or broke up around it, buckboard or keelson, furnace or plow. The atmosphere transported and fired them. Feral now, too crude to be more than a primitive weapon, it's simply itself. A bolt cast up by tides that can't float it. With nothing else left, a man kneels over it carefully, here on a shore where the stones themselves are adrift. Cross trees. He'd followed the telephone wires for miles, a wire on each arm of the pole's tall cross trees. Now the ground was level, a kind of plateau. Save for the poles and their solo wires high on each cross arm, he'd been for two days above tree line. The deer were small, their miniature faces facing away from him as they browsed. They fed back over the treeless distance he had already come. Even at noon, the stunted deer sought no cover. The last fawn he passed at arm's length, fed blind on white lichen. He couldn't recall having climbed, the long horizon behind him was flat and familiar sun, the marrow of each hard cross arm sharply wired to its own hard shadow. For two days now he had not been afraid, but now on his third dry dawn the sky would not quicken. He felt like a deer gone blind in that morning's bright haze. But then it opened, where wires from the nearest cross arm sagged into infinite sunlight, out into what might once have been a cross but was not, the plateau split to a depth without bottom. His eyes locked on the gap they met. He grabbed for the ground with his knees and held on his eyes closed down to stretch focus. His wrists pressed back at the edge against the steep thrust of a miniature city, a city so deeply sunk that its buildings had no foundation, but lifted clear in their own improbable light. They were pockmarked with caves, but warm as the wall in a painting of martyrs. Save for the wires stretched over him, humming gently, thinned into nowhere, nothing was filigree here. The beech tree centered within the city bared its dead limbs in brilliant cantilever. The sand traps roofing each building were perfectly raked. The tines of each rake turned up and left naked. He dug his toes into the hard plateau, trying to trench his way back to known maps or nameable wars. Jesus, God, he said, before the deer nose toward him, I once shot a 32 on the back nine at Delft, and now I'm not even myself. 
with nobody left to tell what I came to or how I got here or where it was. The sun, when he said these things, was still climbing and would not let him go or draw back to sleep. Jesus, God, he said when the time came. The mouths of the deer were as soft as the mouths of sheep. Word. In a flat month, in a low field, I hit on a word with just one meaning. One. It got to me hard. I stood back up, grabbing for balance. I tried to hit back, but it meant it. No matter what I did, nothing would yield. I tried old levers, hope, belief, love. Earth would not give, not for the world. Not one prospect of any appeal. That was final. The word itself would have the last word. No way around it, over or through. No reason behind it. Who in God's name had what in mind? I dug as deep as my heart could stand. Lichens. Close to the point a mile upriver where nuclear waste begins to waste. Close to the end of the century, the coast weathers before its next weather. March. The primary colors still sky, ocean, granite, spruce, snow. And in a noon clearing, a knoll in woods the British once stormed. The lichens, as the sun finds them. Non-flowering pioneer plants. A low mix of algae and fungi. They name themselves toad skin or map lichen written on rock. Reindeer rampant through moss. British soldiers in log rot and pale shield lichen against the north side of hemlock, rooted where redcoats fell for nothing, where man availeth not, where the wind veers quiet as if March could prime new life, the lichens still, the lichens Hold close to the bone of the planet. Eaton's Boatyard. To make do, making a living. To throw away nothing, practically nothing. Nothing that may come in handy. Within an inertia of caked paint cans, frozen sea clamps, blown strips of tarp and pulling boat molds, to be able to find for whatever it's worth what has to be there, the requisite tool in this culch there's no end to. The draw shave buried in pot warp, chain and manila jib sheets, or under the bench, the piece that already may fit, the idea it begins to shape up. Not to be put off by split rudders, stripped outboards, half a gasket and nail-sick garboards. To forget for good all the old year's losses, save for what needs be retrieved. A life given to how today feels. To make of what's here, what has to be made to make do.
Pride's Crossing. Born to Pride's Crossing, privately tutored, finished at Foxcroft, engaged to Groton and Harvard, wed after the Coral Sea and Midway, bride to Treasury, wife to Wall Street and mother to Gracie Square, she has been first mate on three Bermuda races and is newly mistress of one round-the-world teak catch. Aboard at her grandfather's inlaid desk, far in the Caribbean, she times to her 46th birthday her annual letter to her last tutor. Her hand is impeccably North Shore italic. Since Arthur's corporate interests require him to be in Aruba one day and north of the Arctic Circle the next, we live somewhat separate lives. Whit has been asked to depart St. Paul's after drugs. We don't know where he goes next. Jilly, whom you last saw the summer she was about to start Chapin, I have just now flown back to New York to abort. I have been hospitalized myself, but I'm out again for a third try. At least I refuse what my friends still in Boston seem nowadays to feast on, the sacrilege of an easy Jesus. Please do not send me condolences. I know you will not. Her script slants increasingly small. I sit to write you aboard an anchored sailboat with my own name on her transom. She is perfectly furled. I am afloat. The crew is ashore. Every halyard and sheet is perfectly coiled. I sit wondering now if life will ever unbraid itself. Or do I mean unsnarl itself? I know that you cannot tell me this. But how, if it does, will I know that it has? This poem takes its title from Conrad's novel, or long short story, Heart of Darkness, and has an epigraph from that story said by the character called the Harlequin Seaman. You ought to have heard him recite poetry. His own, too, it was. Oh, he enlarged my mind. Heart of Darkness. Exterminate the brutes. We remember that part. We remember Kurtz and his final horror. To say he only pretended to be of the new gang, the gang of virtue, is not to have read the full report, or is not to have been there. Marlowe, of course, knew. He was there. But recall how he had to lie as a matter of conscience to get himself back. We know that. We, too, have rivets and work, science and new editions of Towson's inquiry to occupy our minds. Efficiency is what saves us. It would be an error, though, to imagine that Marlowe's tale was ever conclusive. As they knew on the Nelly, counting a river of flickering lights and waiting out a night, Todd, there's not much to go on. The intended, with her blindfold and torch, the background near black, and always in a white suit, the chief accountant. Chained natives dying, pop guns firing into a continent's underbelly, a few shrunken heads on some pointed sticks, and, yes, 
the voice, Vox Clamantis, we know all that, but the center, the center is still elusive. We must find the poem, one that again might enlarge our harlequin mind. Lost as we are, with no choice of nightmares left, but only stakes higher than Kurtz could dream of, what we need is the poem. Not that we'll ever get back to where we in our virtue began, but if at least we try for some coastal station, the poem, the poem that must map the bottom of here, would be some sort of base to start out from. To Chekhov in November when I could bear to read nobody else. Finally, I have come to you out from behind hard mountains that looked like the Urals when I looked back a last time, back across the low river, the old rope ferry sagging downstream. I think now of the ferryman weighed by the army greatcoat I left him on the far bank. My gray mare dances sideways across the shadowless steppe, spooked by my hatless shadow. Whenever we reach the Donets station, where you are already waiting, I have to tell you how a fat troika driver going the other way tipped me his hat and why I could not salute back. And you, I expect, will know his three geldings by name and will tell me the driver's story, knowing who owns him and by what human motive on this particular day he drove his troika to mountains beyond the river. There is much about myself that I do not believe, much about the river and every mountain behind it I cannot yet love. Yet owing to what you wrote me, I ride to meet you, slowed as I am by how my mind drifts sideways, I give my mare free rein, dancing sideways toward the Donat station. You will be there waiting to tell me where I've been. Not to tell lies. He has come to a certain age, to a tall house older than he is, older by far than he ever will be. He has moved his things upstairs to a room which corners late sun. It warms a schooner model, his daughter's portrait, the rock his doctor brought him back from Amchitka. When he looks at the rock, he thinks Melville. When he touches the lichen, he dreams Thoreau. Their testaments shelve the inboard edge of the oak-legged table he writes on. He has nailed an ancestor's photograph high over his head. He has moored his bed perpendicular to the north wall. Whenever he rests, his head is compassed barely west of Polaris. He believes in powers, gravity, true north, magnetic north, love, in how his wife loved the year of their firstborn. Whenever he wakes, he sees the clean page in his portable. He has sorted life out. He feels moved to say all of it, most of it all. He tries to come close. He keeps coming close. He has gathered himself in order not to tell lies.
stove. I wake up in the bed my grandmother died in. November rain. The whole house is cold. Long stairs, two rooms through to the kitchen. Walls that haven't been painted in 60 years. They must have shone then. Pale sun, new pumpkin, old pine. Nothing shines now but the nickel trim on the grandmother stove, an iron invention the whole room leans to surround. Even when it is dead, the dogs sleep close behind it. Now they bark out, but let rain return them. They can smell how the stove is going to be lit. Small chips of pine from the woodshed, then hardwood kindling. I build it all into the firebox on top of loose wads of last June's Bangor news. Under the grate my first match catches, flames congregate, the dogs watch, the stove begins to attend old wisdom. After the first noisy moments, I listened for Laura. She cooked all the mornings my grandmother died. She ruled the whole kitchen the year I was seven. I can see Boyd Varnum, a post outside the side door. He's waiting for Laura up in the front of the house to get right change for his winter squash. Laura says Boyd's got the best winter squash in the village. When Boyd gets paid, she ties her apron back on and lets in the Eggman. He has a green wagon. Laura tells him how last night her husband hit her. She shows him the marks. All her bruised arms adjust dampers and vents. Under the plates where turnips are coming to boil, she shifts both pies in the oven. The dogs feel warmer now. I bank on thick coal. The pains steam up as sure as November. Rain, school, a talkative stove to come home to at noon, and Laura sets my red mittens to dry on the nickel shelves next to the stovepipe. Laura knitted my mittens. I can still smell the litter of spaniels whelped between the stove and the wall. There's venison cooking. There's milk toast being warmed on the furthest backed plate. Milk toast to send upstairs to my dead mother's mother. Because Laura says she is sick. Laura says she is awful sick. When Laura goes up to my grandmother's bed, I play with the puppies under the stove. After they suckle and go back to sleep, because I am in the second grade and am seven, I practice reading the black iron letters raised on the black oven door. Even though I don't know who Queen Clarion was, I'm proud I can read what the oven door says. It says, Queen Clarion, Wood and Bishop, Bangor, Maine, 1911. Cleaning out the garage. Hooks, screw eyes, and screws, the walls thick with bent nails to catch on. Somebody's grandfather must have hoped his grandson would use these nicked tools. Ads, spokeshave, and saw hang with dead moth wings, spidered to leaning studs. Fifty winters have heaved this catch-all off its foundations, cracked the poured floor, and left to mildew the tent I almost slept in, moored to my boyhood backyard. 
sponges that bilged three lapstrake rowboats, the lot of them rotted or sunk, stiffened like pockmarked soft footballs, instructions for washing the Model T Ford curled tacked to the faucet plank, the wall is shelved with paint cans left to weather, their paint skinned like my grandfather's wrinkles. The gloss has gone soft on his set of golf clubs, troon, nap iron, and niblick, bagged with balls but no putter, their hickory shafts still true. It's summer when I haul back to all this, a goldfinch dead and a box of unplanted seeds, chemicals bagged to poison the weeds that still flourish. Stormed by the dust of my sweeping, storm windows lean stacked like the panes my boyhood couldn't see through. I try to sweep out the useless stuff I still cherish a drugstore sloop that tipped over, a bathtub submarine that floated between my legs like a small sick fish. I try not to sink in this scrap I dive to uncover. Cars jacked up here in 18 and 43, the Ford and a Chevy, still stain the cracked floor with drip from their oil pans. My great-grandfather's substitutes, Civil War sword, points north like the rusted compass my family never trusted. In all the winters, somebody shoveled a path to this island garage. There was gear for voyages, wars, or rebuilding enough to see whole generations through. I'm game for different winters in this high summer. A woman I loved who refused me taught me what I mean to leave here, how to let go what won't do. After the Rebuilding after the rebuilding was done and the wood stove finally installed, after the ripping out of walls, tearing back to its beams the house he'd lived in frozen for over fifty years, he started mornings up with the world's most expensive kindling. Not just scraps of red oak from new flooring, ends of clear birch from kitchen trim, and knots from number two pine, but odd lot pieces of his old life, window frames clawed from his daughter's lost room, his grandfather's coat peg shelving his mother had rolled her crust on, and lathing first plastered the year Thoreau moved to Walden. The wood stove itself was new, the prime heat for four new rooms descended from seven, the central logic for all the opening up, for revisions hammered out daily, weeks of roughing in, and after months of unfigured costs, the final bevels and the long returning. Oh, when he first got up to rekindle the fire of November mornings, he found that everything held heat, he sweat as he tossed the chunks in. He found himself burning, burning. Day Rise At first light I hear miles of silence. Except for the first selectman snow tires snuffling up Main Street, it's Sunday quiet half awake, knowing that deer season's done. I dream of does wounded, bedded in spruce groves, and bucks downed in the bog, 
who had last night to give up. I doze with Han Shan, the old Tang drunk, who took to Cold Mountain after the capital turned down his poems. The wood fire's dying, I get myself up to stoke it, rewrite night notes next to the stove and wake my wife. After breakfast, before I try to home in on today's unwritten poem, we go out into winter to fell next year's wood. With her small axe and my stuttering saw, we cut near the bog on the low spruce crown of the woodlot we call Cold Knoll. Syntax Short of words in that quick dark where there was nothing between them, he longed in her for some light verb which, if she could, would ease him. Saying it Saying it, trying to say it, not to answer to logic, but leaving our very lives open to how we have to hear ourselves say what we mean, not merely to know all told our far neighbors, or hear beside us now the stranger we sleep next to, not to get it said and be done, but to say the feeling, its present shape, to let words lend it dimension, to name the pain to confirm how it may be born, through what in ourselves we dream to give voice to, to find some word for how we bear our lives. Daily, as we are daily wed, we say the world is a wedding for which, as we are constantly finding, the ceremony has not yet been found. What wine, what bread, what language sung? We wake at night to imagine and again wake at dawn to begin, to let the intervals speak for themselves, to listen to how they feel, to give pause to what we're about, to relate ourselves over and over, in time beyond time to speak some measure of how we hear the music. Today, if ever, to say the joy of trying to say the joy. First lesson. Lie back, daughter. Let your head be tipped back in the cup of my hand. Gently, and I will hold you. Spread your arms wide, lie out on the stream and look high at the gulls. A dead man's float is face down. You will dive and swim soon enough where this tide water ebbs to the sea. Daughter, believe me when you tire on the long thrash to your island. Lie up and survive. As you float now where I held you and let go, remember when fear cramps your heart what I told you. Lie gently and wide to the light year stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you.
generation. A bald fifty-some, shaving in his dead father's nickel-plated extensible mirror, patented 1902. The father, stripped to bathe, notes his bare grandson studying again from four-year-old eye level, the old primary stem hanging out from the apple pouch where he remembers his father's presiding over a wad of wire hair. He shaves considering all the trouble. Relations Old Light, New Sun, Postmistress, Earth, 04421 From broken dreams we wake to every day's brave history. The gravity of every moment we wake to let our lives inhabit. Now, here again, this very day, passionate as all Yates woke in old age to hope for, the sun turns up under an offshore cloud bank spun at seven hundred and some miles per hour to meet it, rosy as the cheeks of a kiosk woman Homer may have been touched by, just as Janet is touching, climbing familiar steps, granite locally quarried, to work at 04421, a peninsula village spun just as Janet is spun into light, light appearing to resurrect not simply its own life, but the whole improbable system, tugging the planet around to look precisely as Janet looks, a light with the gravity of her office, before turning the key that opens up its full radiance, the familiar arrivals, departures, and even predictable orbits in which with excited constancy, by how to each other we're held, we keep from spinning out, by how to each other we hold. before sleep. The day put away before bed, the house almost closed before night. By the time I walk out over the knoll, down the steep main street that dead ends in the sea, the village has put out its lights. The winter stars are turned up over the tide, a tide so quiet the harbor holds stars, the planet holds. Before the village turns over in sleep, I stand at the edge of the tide, letting my feet feel into the hillside where my dead ancestors live. Whatever I know before sleep surrounds me, I cannot help know. By blood or illness, Gossip or hope, I'm relative to every last house. Before I climb home up the hill, I hold. I wait for myself to quiet. Breathing the breath of sleepers, I cannot help love. 